I uh, have been to meetings all of my life in the ministry and even before I got in the ministry. And I remember so many times when I would go to church, I'd really need a word from the Lord. So I know what it means to get dressed and come to the house of God knowing that you need to hear something. So I hope tonight before you leave that you'll hear something that helps you. Pastor Maloney, I've loved you and respected you a long time. This man has a heart for God. You know that? Would you give him a good God bless you, him and Sister Maloney? <clears throat> Whenever I have a close ties to the Church of God, matter of fact, I'm Assemblies of God, and I've been Assemblies of God all my life, but I really have connections to the Church of God. I love to hear Church of God people sing. Assembly of God people can't sing. White men can't jump and Assembly of God people can't sing, but Church of God people can sing. And I love the Church of God. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you this story real quick. Whenever I was called to preach, my father left us when I was 12, and um, I was raised in a very dysfunctional home. My father used to beat my mother, actually, for taking us to church, and it was a really a bad situation. He didn't like Pentecost. He didn't want my mother to be in a Christian he did not like speaking in tongues, and so I say it respectfully, but uh, my father left us whenever I was 12, but from 8 to 12 was very difficult years in my life, so my mother, when my father left, my mother had a nervous breakdown, and she didn't come out of the bedroom for three months. It was a horrible situation, but it was all over church. My father didn't want her being a Christian, and she would never put it, pushed it down his throat. She was always gracious woman, loved God, loved her husband, loved her family, kept a wonderful house. But when she became a Christian, when I was six years old in the Assemblies of God, my brother-in-law was a tent evangelist, and my mother got saved under his tent revival, and my sister was dating him at the time, and they later got married. So when my father left at 12, uh, for two years, I was just really messed up. You know, I'd, I loved my father, and... Um, I missed him. I, you know, I hated my father was gone and I was lonely for him, but yet at the same time, I loved my mother and I loved the stand that she took and the beatings that she took for Pentecost and for the Spirit of God. So um, from, from, t uh, from 12 to 14, I just was, didn't know what to do, which way to go. I, I just, uh, I was messed up. And I remember I started going to the youth group, and I liked the youth group, and I saw young people beginning to receive the Holy Spirit. I couldn't receive the Holy Spirit. I sought it earnestly, could not get it. But I made up my mind early in my life, I was never going to fake speaking in tongues. If it was real, I was going to hold out for the real thing. That's just the way I am. If God's got something and it's real, I'm not going to fake it. And if you ever start faking things, then you're a hypocrite to your own self, not necessarily to other people. So I, I sought the Holy Spirit so much I couldn't get it. Finally, I just told the Lord one day when I sought it so earnestly, I sort of took it as rejection. I began to think, well, maybe I came from such a bad family, you know, God didn't care for me, or I just didn't know. So I told the Lord one day, I said, Lord, I tell you what, if you want to fill me with the Holy Spirit, look me up, you know where I live. So... Um, I just quit seeking the Holy Spirit, quit going to youth group. My mother was worried about me. So I remember I went to church with her one Sunday and was sitting in church and the pastor said, now if you want to receive the Holy Spirit, and he said, if you have young people that's never received the Holy Spirit, he said, I'd like for you to bring, uh, let them come Tuesday night. He said, because we're going to be praying for young people to receive the Holy Spirit. So there'll be men here to pray with the young boys and there'll be women here to pray with the girls. So I remember I felt something when he said that, and I turned to my mother, and I said, Mother, can I go? And she said, You sure can. So from Sunday till Tuesday night, that was going to be on a Tuesday night, I began to really pray for the Holy Spirit. And I remember uh, Monday, all day long, I was expectant. Tuesday came around. I woke up that morning, had to walk to school, had to walk home, of course, and so all the way to school, walking to school, I was praying and asking the Lord to fill me with the Holy Spirit. I said, Lord, I want it more than anything. I know I need it. I don't know why I can't receive it. I said, Lord, I want the Holy Spirit so bad. So I got to school that morning, and I was sitting in my first period. It was, called, it was biology class. 
And we were seated alphabetically in the classroom and Kilpatrick K, I was right in the middle of the class and the projector was right by my head. While they were showing the film on dissection, they were cutting something up, I forget what it was, now who cares? <laughs> but they were showing a film on dissection and I was praying under my breath and I said, Lord, I want the Holy Spirit, please. I said, I don't want to beg, but Lord, please fill me. I know there's a destiny to my life, but I need the Holy Spirit. And I said, Lord, I saw what my mother went through. I want the Holy Spirit. And so my middle name is Alton, and everybody always called me Alton, Kilpatrick. My first name is John. So nobody in my life ever called me John. So while the film was going, I heard the volume go down like somebody turned it down with a knob. And when it did, I jumped. Now, I don't know why I jumped, but it felt sort of like I was leaving the room or something. I don't know what was going on, but I jumped. And in my left ear, I heard the audible voice of the Lord in biology class. And he said, John, just like a father calling his son's name, he said, John, he said, this day I have called you to preach my word. And he said, I'll be with you but you must keep yourself from the other boys and girls in the neighborhood that will have a bad influence on you because if you don't, I'll lose you. And then he said, I'm calling you to this, 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 and this. Five things. He named them. All five things. And as soon as he named them, he, the last thing he said was, this day I'll confirm this call in your ear. So as soon as the Lord got through speaking, I heard the projector come right back up in my ear. And I was sitting there in shock because, number one, I couldn't believe God knew where I went to school. I literally couldn't believe that he knew where I went to school. I knew he knew where I lived. I believed that. And I knew that he knew where I went to church. I believed that. But he found me at school, man, in biology class. And I heard his voice with 30 other students in there but I heard him and nobody else heard him. And the second thing that had me amazed was I couldn't believe it that he was calling me to preach before he filled me with the Holy Spirit. Like, you can't do that. You've got to fill me first. And so as soon as the Lord got through speaking to me, I got up out of my chair and the bell rang and I had to go to math class. Well, when I got up to walk, I couldn't even feel my legs at all. I couldn't feel anything from my waist down. It literally was like I could just swish right through it. And I had to walk up a ramp to the math class, and it was a pretty good ways away. The whole time I walked to math class, it literally felt like I was gliding on air. Literally felt that way. I couldn't even feel my legs at all. So when I got to math class, my math teacher always made fun of me because when I would go to school, I'd always have mama get me shirts that had a pocket in them. And I'd always take my New Testament to school, and during the break, you know, during class, I'd read my New Testament, not to be religious. I just was hungry for the Word. So my math teacher would say, oh, class, he's reading his Bible again. And they would do thumbs down, you know, and make all kind of noises. So when I got to math class this day, she was out. She wasn't there. Praise God. So I walked in, and there was a teacher filling in for her, and he was a retired Baptist preacher. And he had taught the class one time before, so I knew him a little bit. He just taught the class one time before. So when I was sitting there behind my desk, waiting for the bell to ring, I had my book stacked up on my desk, and I was sort of hiding behind my books because I was still trying to simulate everything that happened last period. So my math teacher was sitting behind his desk, and he had his glasses on the end of his nose, and he looked over the class, and he he looked at me back there and he said, come here. I said, so he got up and walked back there where I was. And he said, son, he said, what's going on with you? I said, why do you ask? He said, I see the glory of the Lord all over you. A Baptist, a Baptist preacher said that. There had to be glory in the room, amen? <laughs> so he said, I, I see the glory of the Lord all over you. And I, I started crying. I busted out crying. And I told him what happened last period. Well, by the time I told him that, he started crying. So by the time the bell rang to start class, we're both sitting there squalling, you know. And um, 
So I thought that was a confirmation because the Lord said, this day I'll confirm this call in your ear. So I ran home when the bell rang at 325. Mama, when my father left us, Mama had to get a job cleaning floors in a nursing home. She only had a third grade education. So I ran home, and she'd have me a sandwich fixed or some tea, and she'd pray over me, read the Bible to me, and she'd go to work. And she had to work from 4 to midnight. So I ran home as fast as I could. I couldn't wait to tell Mama what happened. But when I ran in the house and I snatched the screen door open, ran up the steps and snatched the screen door open, and I said, Mama, come here, hurry. And she came out of the back of the house real slow. And I said, Mama, sit down. i got something to tell you. She said, no, son, you sit down. I said, ooh, Mama, this is important. She said, no, you sit down. She said, today, I was here at the house by myself, and she said, a woman from the Church of God came by selling donuts. Does that make any sense? <laughs> she, she was selling donuts for the Church of God raising money for something, and Mama went back to the back of the house, got a dollar out of her purse, paid her through the screen door. Mother had me when she was almost 42, so by now she's like 56. She didn't look young enough to have a son, a young son. There was no pictures in the living room. There was nothing sitting out in the living room to spark this lady off. But they exchanged no pleasantries. Mother paid her through the window, or through the screen door. She turned around to walk off the porch. She stopped dead in her tracks. She laid the remaining donuts on the banister. And she gave out a message in tongues on the front porch. And the interpretation said, this day I've called your son to preach the word, preach my word. I'll be with him, but you must keep him from the other boys and girls in the neighborhood that will have a bad influence on him because if you don't, I'll lose him. And then bam, 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 bam. All five things the Lord called me to do. In class, my mother repeated in my ear. And then she said, now, son, what was it she was going to tell me? <laughs> and so, isn't that awesome? I don't say that. I don't say that to draw attention to myself at all, but I just say it to let you know, whenever you're called to preach the gospel, whenever you're called, there's nothing else that's appealing to me at all. I love church. I love everything about church. I love the presence of God. I'm not interested too much in anything else. I really love the presence of God, and I love revival. And God graced us, and he blessed us by sending revival to Brownsville. It lasted five years, and it attracted four and a half million people that came through those doors at Brownsville. When Brownsville first started off, it started off in 1939 in September, right about this time of the month. And um, it started off in a horse stable. And um, I remember I went one time to the hospital to see one of our old maids in the church. She had never married. She was in her 70s or 80s, I guess, right before revival broke out, about two years, a year or two before revival broke out, maybe less, I can't remember. But I went to visit her at Baptist Hospital. And um, when I prayed for her, I got ready to walk out, and the sun was going down, and it was just dark enough in the room I started to cut a light on. She said, no, 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 that's not necessary. She said, I just want to, would you just sit down a minute and just let me tell you a story. I want to pass this on to you because I may die and I want you to know this. I said, sure. So I sat down there in the dark and she told me this story real quickly. It won't take but a minute. But she said, Brother Kilpatrick, I was there on the first Sunday that the church started and I was there all along. Been here all these many years. She said, Brownsville, when it started out, it was a special place. We started out in a horse stable. And she said, there was a woman prophetess that used to come through here. And she always wore a nurse's uniform. Didn't wear the hat, but she wore the white dress, white stockings, and all that, white shoes. But she was a prophetess, and she was a powerful woman of God, a very holy woman, godly woman. And I think he said she was Church of God also. And so... She said one morning in January after the church first started out, she said uh, she went over and stood by the old pot-bellied stove and prophesied. And she said, yea, the Lord says, I usually send churches to the nations, but I'm going to do a different thing here. I'm going to bring the nations to this church. 
And she looked at me and she said, I've lived all these years and I've never seen that. But she said, Brother Kilpatrick, that woman was a woman of God. And she said, as surely as I lay here, she said, it'll happen. She wasn't gone but just a matter of months. And revival broke out on Father's Day. And the nations of the earth literally came to Brownsville and was touched by the power of God. You know what I say? I don't know if we need a Democrat or Republican, but I know we need revival in America. Can you shout amen? Would you stand with me, please? Everybody, I want you just for a minute, just lift up your hands and let's just worship the Lord. Come on. Let's sustain it for about a minute or two. Come on, did you do that? Lift your voice. Sato Ramondo Rabayanto. Shipeke Parama Sato Rabayanto Rabayando. Come on, church. Woo! Sheparaba Soro Bayando Lolabayando. Bari pura maraba saramando kure biando. Man, I feel the Lord in here. Come on, church. Lift your voice. Lift your voice. Lift him up. Woo! She baby ado basarabore marando moro. Shapato kupura basanamayando. In the mighty name of Jesus. <laughs> oh Lord, we glorify and magnify your glorious name, Jesus. Worthy is the Lord, worthy is the Lord. Shapare Surabokura Manda Bayando Lobasara Bayandai. Man, wow. You feel that presence? Don't rush that, friend. Hallelujah. 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 Mando baraba shalaba sondo kuparabayando. Uh, man, <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, Shepo Manamayando Bosara Bayando. You may be seated. I'm going to take a different route tonight. I was all prepared for a message, but I'm going to take a different route. So when I was talking, I felt the Holy Spirit dealing with me about something. So is it okay if I just talk to you tonight? I want to talk to you about the presence of the Lord. I want to talk to you about the power of God, the presence of God. I know there's a lot of young people here tonight. <clears throat> I'd just like to talk to you out of my heart if I may. I'm not one of these that has to preach. I preach all the time. I preach many, many, many times a year. But I'm in a college town and I'm with a denomination that I love dearly, the Church of God, and love the young people. So I just want to talk to you tonight for a little while out of my heart. When I was called to preach, 
we went to church, and um, it was on a Wednesday night. And I remember my pastor walked up to my mother, and then he was in his 60s probably, 68, 69 years old. Powerful man of God. His name was Wetzel. He was a German. He was brilliant. Had a, had a mind unlike any other person I've ever met. He had a photographic memory. But he was humble as an old shoe. Humble man. He had a relationship with God I wish I had. He walked with him and he talked with him. Nothing spooky about it. Nothing weird about it. It was just a solid man of God. After all the damage that had been done to me by my father living in that kind of a situation, I remember I was at church with my mother on Wednesday night, and he walked up to my mother, and he said, Here am I. He said, I hear God's called out to preach. And she said, Yes, sir, he has. And he said, Well, let me ask you a question. He said, Would you let me take him and teach him how to pray? And I remember I was standing there, and I thought to myself, Wait a minute. I'm not called to pray. I'm called to preach, praise God. But that old man knew something that I didn't know, and it's this. If you're ever going to be effective in the ministry, you've got to learn to, first of all, have a prayer life. You've got to know how to get a hold of God. So I started praying with him, and he prayed every night. He was at the church every night praying. He was a man of prayer. He was a man of the supernatural, but nothing spooky. I was with him. I used to wonder, was he an angel or was he a man? He was a man that if he ever told you something that the Lord told him, he didn't know it, but I'd go off and make notes. And every note I ever made and stuck in my wallet came to pass, every one of them. He was not one to say, the Lord told me to tell you this. He wasn't one of those type, but he was a man that if he ever told you something, you could count on it. But I started praying with him, and I'll never forget whenever I started praying with him, I felt so deprived. I was 14. He was 68. Some nights when we would pray, there would be 30 men there. It was called midnight prayer meetings. We always prayed with the lights out. Some nights there were 30 men there. Some nights there was 18, 20. Some nights there was four or five, but most nights it was just me and him. And I got close to him, and he really became like a father to me. He became my father, actually. Spiritual father, and he actually became like a father to me. He loved me, and I loved him. Our hearts were blended together. It was like a David and Jonathan, except he was just a lot older man. But there was something that God put together there. He loved Bible prophecy. He taught me Bible prophecy. He taught me to love Israel. He taught me to love the moving of the Holy Spirit. He taught me to love the supernatural. Taught me the pitfalls of the supernatural. Every night, he would teach the Word of God. Every night, after church, even on Wednesday nights, after church on Sunday nights, we'd still have that prayer meeting seven nights a week. After he preached on Sunday night, after he preached on Wednesday night, He'd still go in that upstairs Sunday school room. He'd take an old car antenna, stretch it out, write on the blackboard different lessons, and then he'd stand there and teach us for about 45 minutes to an hour. And then after he'd teach us, then he'd walk over and hand one of us the chalk and hand us that car antenna, and he said, now I want you to get up and teach me what I just taught you. And he was teaching us how to teach. He was teaching us how to preach. So you better be listening. So when you'd get up and you'd start teaching and you said something wrong, you'd say, now, son, one day you're going to be a pastor. One day there's going to be people listening to you and you need to make sure you're sound in your doctrine. Now, what you just said, I didn't say that, and you got that messed up. So here's what I said, and I want to show you, don't go that way. So he was gracious, very full of mercy, gracious. But many nights it was just me and him. But he was faithful to teach even if it was just me there. When we first started praying, I felt so deprived. I felt like, you know, here I am young, I'm 14. I love ball, I love football, I love baseball, softball. Before we would pray, after we, he'd teach us the word, we'd always drive up to a place called Bibb City in Columbus, Georgia. We'd go to a cafe there, and uh, we'd get a bite to eat, fellowship a little bit, then we'd come back to the church, 
And by 11.30 at night, he was always laying in the floor for 30 minutes from 11.30 to 12 o'clock. And he would tell preacher stories. He'd tell what God had done in his ministry through the years. About how God saved people, how he prayed, how God answered prayer, healings, things like that. So he would teach earlier in the day, early in the evening. From 11.30 to 12, he'd take 30 minutes. He'd tell nothing but preacher stories. And at high midnight, everybody would be praying. And so he would always take his coat off, take his tie off. He would roll his sleeves up. He'd always go and disappear in the back part of the sanctuary in the furthest left-hand corner, kneel down there, and that was his prayer corner. And I would stay there with him sometime for hours, never under an hour. I don't ever remember praying under an hour, but usually an hour and a half, two hours, sometime three hours, I'd get home at 3 o'clock in the morning, have to be at school at 7.30 on the DCT program. And then, you know, we was right back at it again the next night. I learned so much from that man. But when I first started praying with him, I felt like, what am I doing in this room with this old man teaching the Bible every night and moaning and groaning and praying? What am I doing here? I feel so out of place. And I remember I always... There were just several times I wanted to break down and just weep. I felt so trapped. We'd be going up to Bibb City to the, whole, to the cafe, and I'd, we'd pass the ball fields, and you could see the lights burning at night, and you could hear the aluminum bat connecting with the ball, and you could see the ball flying up through the lights. And I thought, how come I can't be out there? How come my dad can't be out there and my mother can't be out there? What's wrong with me? Why am I so different? Why do I feel so different? I don't feel like other young boys. I don't even feel like a young boy. And here I am in these prayer meetings with this old man. And I felt like that probably for months. And as we would pray, he would teach us the principles of prayer, teach us how to pray, the different kinds of prayer, focus. He'd teach us to get the gum out of our mouth, to not be fellowshipping over in the corner. When it's time to pray, it's time to pray. It's not time to talk. It's not time to fellowship. It's time to get a hold of God. Don't pray to be heard. Don't preach when you pray. Talk to the Lord. Focus on the Lord. So many things. I won't go through all that. But I remember we had a revival come to our church, and it was a powerful revival. I remember the evangelist's name. I remember him to this day. He was um, handsome, gifted, talented, Powerful preacher, young, single, and it went for about six or seven or maybe eight weeks, and I remember one day the pastor called him in, and he said, son, I'm going to shut the revival down, and I'm going to tell you why. He said, something's not right. I know something's not right, and he said, I'm going to end the revival, and I know I'm going to do it at my detriment because these people love you here. But in my spirit, I know that, that something's not right, and I'm going to close it down. Well, that evangelist went out immediately and did the pastor severe damage. So bad damage that the church went down, 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 almost to nothing. Then it was found out shortly thereafter that he had been fondling some of the boys and girls in the church and some of the young people was caught, was tried, went to prison, got out of prison, did the same thing again, and went back to prison. As far as I know, he's still in prison to this day. But all those people that left the church because of that evangelist never came back and apologized to the pastor. And the church just went down, down, down. I saw the church go down. I saw it break the pastor's heart. I saw my first church trouble before I was shaving. So I remember by now he had become my pastor and my father, really. We were very close. So this particular night, we went up to the 38th Street Cafe to get a bite to eat on Sunday night after church, and the church that day was rough. I mean, it was rough. You couldn't hardly, they couldn't hardly sing during worship. He had a struggle preaching. It was just hellish. And I remember thinking that morning, and I was 15 at the time, I thought to myself, Whew, man, this don't feel like church. Something's wrong. So we went out that night to get a bite to eat, and after we ordered, the waitress walked away. He said, boys, he said, um, 
I want to uh, share some news with you. He said, I'm going to be leaving. Well, man, when he said that, I got a frog in my throat. And it was like I wasn't really hearing that, you know. It just startled me. It shocked me. He said, I'm going to be leaving. And he said, um, but he said, I know God's going to send you somebody else that will love you like I have. And I thought to myself, get real. Nobody's going to love us and take time with us like you have. Nobody will do that. So I wanted to cry. I wanted to bust out crying, but I wouldn't, didn't want him to see me. I didn't want anybody else to see me. So I just stuffed it in. And I remember that night, I don't remember much he said after that. We went back to the church, walked in in the dark, like we always prayed in the dark. He laid down on the floor, started telling preacher stories. He said, I'm, he said, I'm going to be taking a church in Winter Haven, Florida. It's already been approved and I'm going to be moving. He said, I'll be leaving within two weeks. So when I got back to church that night, I still felt like I was going to cry, and I didn't want him to see me cry. So I didn't sit up there and lay on the floor with the rest of the guys. There were 17 of us that night in the prayer meeting. But I went and I sat in the church, like over here in this section, to the right of the aisle. And I sat about halfway back in the dark, and I'm fuming. And I'm saying to myself, Man, if I could just leave, I'd never come back to church. If I could just leave, I'd never get involved in church again. It's too painful. I lost my real father, now I'm losing this man. And I said, well, I'll walk home. And that was back during the 60s whenever they had the rioting and the looting because of the civil rights era. And there was looting and burning all around our church nightly and so it was too dangerous to walk home and the, the, the city bus ran every night but Sunday nights and I couldn't catch a city bus. So I was just sitting there fuming and I was just saying, I'll never be hurt like this again and I just was gonna tolerate the rest of the hours until they all got through praying and pastor loaded me up in his car and took me and dropped me off at home and then that was gonna be my last night I was never coming back. But you know something? I've learned something. And I learned it that night, and I've practiced it ever since then. Whenever you feel trapped, it just may be the Lord making you feel trapped. Whenever nothing will open, whenever everything feels like that nothing's going for you, you feel like you're hemmed in, it may be the Holy Spirit. So I was just sitting there fuming. And so 17 of us in the prayer meeting that night Back in those days, we had altar benches in the front of the church. It was a rectangular building. There was big altars over here and big altars over here. And so I remember seeing these guys walking around trying to pray. It was so difficult to pray because of the atmosphere in that church. It was so heavy. It was so difficult to pray that I remember many of them just went and plopped down after a few minutes. I'd never seen that before, and I've been praying there about a year. And pastor got up after praying just a few minutes and walked back up. I saw his white shirt coming through the dark and he walked up and sat on the altar bench. And whenever he sat on the altar bench, first news I know, they're all 17, all 16 other men came up and sat on the altar bench. And I'm the only one left sitting out in the audience. And I thought to myself, I better go up and sit down on the altar bench because I felt something in the atmosphere. You say, why are you telling us this story? Because this story made one of the biggest impacts of my life, and it still affects me to this day. Let me tell you what happened. Remember, I felt trapped. I was hurting like I'd never hurt. I was grieving. I was angry. I was hurting. So finally, when I saw everybody sitting on altar benches, I just came back up and sat down by him. And when I sat down by him, we were all sitting there facing the back of the church, and the church before it was remodeled, I can't tell you exactly how many feet high it was, but it was a high rectangular building. And in the back of the church, there were two big doors. And they were metal doors. They had metal doorknobs on them, and they had plaster walls and no door stops. And so while we were sitting there on the altar benches, it was like just a, a holy hush just whew, came in that building. You could literally feel it. And bam, a power hit both of those doors 
and they both flew open at the same time. Now they were locked with pins in the jam at the top, pins in the jam at the bottom, a key beneath the doorknob, a deadbolt, and a latch. They were locked five ways. And when that power hit those doors, it did no damage to them whatsoever. Boom! They just both flew open at the same time. I'm 15 years old. Remember I told you when I first started praying with him, I said to myself, I feel so deprived. I feel so like, what am I doing here with this old man? But here's what I want to say to you before I move any further. If you pray long enough, you'll pray until something happens. Night after night. So as soon as those doors popped open, in off of the porch of that church walked one angel. And he come in the middle aisle and he turned in the back of the church behind the pews and he went and stood where pastor always prayed, knelt down and prayed. Right in behind him came another one and turned just like a soldier and he walked over and stood by the library and I started the church library and I remember that big old bookcase was so rickety that when I'd put books in there on the top shelf it would rock a little bit and it was a big old huge bookcase and I felt so small up against it but when that angel stood beside it it looked like a little matchbox. And the doors were open, left wide open I'm 15 years old. I'm sitting there. We're all sitting there. All 17 of us experienced it. And I looked, and I looked at this angel over here, and he filled it from the top to the bottom, almost. This one over here filled it to the top to the bottom. They had no wings. They never said a word. We never addressed them. They walked in in the dark. You could see that they were angels. Clearly, there was enough light coming in from street lights. You could see that they were angels. They had no wings. They looked like warriors. Huge men, most huge men I've ever seen in my life, talking about huge. And they stood there just like a soldier, just like this. Around them, there was a little bit of something that I could tell. We talked about it later. It, I don't know what it was. It was like some kind of a power field around them, sort of like an aura. But it wasn't real distinguishable, but it was an aura of some kind. And they stood there just like a soldier. And then, like they received a cue from another world, I don't know how long they stood there. I don't know how long they were there, but I remember as a 15-year-old boy, I looked at that, and I got it blazed in my spirit and I looked at this one, and I looked back at that one, I looked back at this one, and I said, I must never forget this as long as I live. And so as soon as they, just it's like they received some kind of a cue from another world, I don't know what it was, but as soon as they walked in, they stepped out, they came to the aisle, they turned like a soldier, the first one that came in went out first, the second one left, Stepped out, walked to the aisle, turned, walked out the door. Left the doors open. Pastor got right up. He walked, started walking back toward the back, and it was evident where he was going. He was going back there to close those doors. <laughs> I wasn't going to let him get back there without me being right in behind him. I mean, I jumped right in behind him because now I'm not thinking about catching the bus no more. Now I'm not thinking about walking home no more. Now I'm thinking, oh my God, you know? What I'm saying is when I felt so deprived, I felt so, I felt so hurt and I felt so, I'm not ever going back to church again. Bam, we couldn't even get a, 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 a bus that night. God had everything fixed to where I had to be there and I had to stay to see that in my most hurtful moment of my life. Can I tell you something? In your most, most hurtful moments, in your most trying moments, it's when God will come through for you and God will show you his glory. Come on, give him praise. So whenever, whenever they walked out, pastors started walking back there. And I remember I jumped right in behind him and all 17 of us jumped right in behind him. It must have tickled him. He didn't say a word, but we went right down that aisle. But I'm going to tell you something. When you got back to the area where those angels stepped in that church, that foyer area, we didn't even make it to the foyer. 
Every one of us, all 17 of us, went down in the spirit, and not just down, but out. And we didn't wake up until the next morning when the sun was coming through the glass windows. About 7 o'clock in the morning, we all woke up about the same time. I was laying across the man's knees along his calves. We were piled up like somebody played fiddlesticks with us. Those doors were still open from the night before. Pastor closed the doors. Remember I told you that the evangelist caused the pastor a lot of damage and the pastor was leaving? That Sunday morning, you remember I told you that the church was hellish, the service was hellish? Down to a baker's dozen, wasn't hardly anybody there at all. Pastor was leaving. He's done told us he's resigning, he's leaving. When that happened and those angels came in there, never said a word, never lifted a finger, just showed up and stood there. They broke the hell off that house. The following Wednesday night, time for church, Church is packed out with people. Word evidently got out. There were so many people in that church that night, we didn't have room to accommodate them. Everything went along normal until pastor said, bow your head over the offering. And whenever he started praying over the offering, 38 people slid out of their seat and fell on the floor and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And here's what pastor told us. He said, boys... He said, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and told me that night when the angels came in. He said, Raymond, I don't want you to leave here. I want you to stay here and I want you to pour into these boys because I'm going to use them to touch more in their generation than you'll ever touch in your generation. And he stayed. And what I saw in that church that night when those angels came in I saw something so powerful. I saw two heavenly beings show up, never said a word, never lifted a finger, but that atmosphere of that church changed in a moment, just that quick, and it never went back to that dead, dry, sterile atmosphere. Can you say praise the Lord? Hallelujah. Let's give him praise here for just a few minutes. Hallelujah. So, when I took my first church, I was 20 years old, right out of Bible school in Lakeland, Florida. I was 20, almost 21 years old. Um, the church was 40 people when I took it. It grew. God blessed it. I took another church in Warner Robins, Georgia. God blessed it. It grew. I took a church, the third church in Evansville, Indiana. God blessed me there, and I took Brownsville in 1982. It was running a little bit less than 300 people when I took it. So whenever I took Brownsville, church began to grow. We had to go into a building program. And we were three years in this one building program. That was architecturally. That was financial, getting the finances together and the actual construction. I was so busy, so busy, in over 200 meetings getting ready to build a new church. Church was booming and thriving and growing. But I still loved the Lord and I was still preaching my heart out, but I was not having time to really pray like I needed to pray. So I wasn't backsliding, I wasn't growing cold, I was just too busy. So after we got the new church built, it was wonderful, glorious. I'm walking in the church one day praying, and as I'm walking around praying in the brand new church, everything gleaming, it smells great, looks great. I went down to the church on Saturday. I looked under all the pews to make sure nobody was in there. <laughs> I was wanting to pray and I wanted to pour my heart out to God. I locked all the doors, I locked the outside doors of the church. I looked under all the pews, nobody was in there. And I just began to cry out to God out of desperation. I said, God, I am so ashamed to talk to you like this. But I said, God, I have a wife that loves me. I have children that's wonderful, never given me a minute's trouble. I have a church that loves me. I'm known around the world. I said, but God, I, I'm hurting. Why do I hurt like I hurt? I'm lonely. 
And man, I just was pouring my heart out, but here's what the Lord said to me. He said, if you'll make this a house of prayer, I'll pour out my spirit in this place. And that's what the Lord said. That was his response to me. If you'll make this a house of prayer, have I not told you that my house should be known not as a house of preaching, but my house should be known as a house of prayer among all nations. If you'll make this a house of prayer, I'll pour out my spirit here and I won't go through the details, but God, I said, you're gonna have to give me a plan because I know when you call prayer meetings in a church, it's the least attended thing and God, I don't know how to do it. Help me. And immediately I had a download from heaven and I had a plan and it happened in a matter of seconds. And I started dismissing my Sunday night evangelistic service at Brownsville for prayer. And we turned the evangelistic service into a prayer meeting. And it was like a demon jumped up on my shoulder for the first year. And every time I got ready to dismiss the people after praise and worship for prayer, it was like there was a demon jumped up there and screamed in my ear, you better stop this. If you don't, it's going to tear this church all to pieces. People's not going to stay in here and pray. They're going to go to other churches. They're going to go over and they get a sermon. You better change this. You better stop this. That happened every Sunday night for about a year. And I had 12 prayer banners planted in the congregation. I had a prayer banner leader at every 12 prayer banners. And we'd take five minutes after we got through with praise and worship, and the, pray, the prayer banner leaders would take five minutes and they would share the needs that they were going to be praying about that night around the prayer banner. I always went to the leaders of our country up in the balcony. We had one on healing. We had one for schools. We had one for uh, warfare. We had a banner for other churches and pastors and evangelists. My wife was over the revival prayer banner. So they would take five minutes, and after five minutes, I'd have the people on the sound booth watch their watch. After five minutes, we'd bring up the worship music. And that instrumental music in the background, it was really melodious, beautiful, powerful. And they all knew when they heard that music come up to stop talking. It was time for everybody to pray. So people would begin to migrate from banner to banner. And if you prayed five minutes around each banner, you prayed an hour. Five times 12 is 60. When we first started praying, we had no problem praying an hour. God gave me that plan. Then it began to be two hours on Sunday night praying. We had communion every Sunday night, the bread of presence. We had holy communion every Sunday night. Then the presence of God in that church became so awesome that it was like each week when you came in there, it was like peeling off another layer of an onion. It was like the, the ceiling was disappearing. You could feel the heavens thinning out and you could feel that God was about to do something. On Father's Day of 1995, bam! The right evangelist, two and a half years of prayer, gases in the church where people had been praying, the gases had filled the sanctuary. Steve Hill was the evangelist. He was the match that lit the fire. It exploded. And when revival came in that morning, on Father's Day morning, and the revival began, I never dreamed you could feel the presence of God that strong and get up and walk away. I was down for four hours. Nobody even touched me. I was down for four hours on that floor. Could not get up. I couldn't even lift my head that far off the platform. It wasn't scary. I wasn't phobic. I couldn't open my eyes. My eyelids dropped first before I fell. It was a weighty presence of the Holy Spirit. It was the glory of God that came in. People call Brownsville the Brownsville Revival. They call it the Pensacola Outpouring. They call it the Pensacola Revival. But really was, was a reintroduction to the American church of the glory of God. It was the manifest weighty presence of the Lord. And I just got through preaching a series on the glory of God. It was nine parts. When I hit the floor that morning, I couldn't even lift my head off the floor. And my mother had just died five weeks before. And my mother, when she was raising me up without a father, she knew how my father hated Pentecost. She knew how he hated church. And she felt so bad for me after my father left. She always said to me, son, I feel so sorry for you. And I said, why, Mama? 
She said, because you don't have a daddy. I said, oh, mama, I don't need no daddy. You're strong enough and you're great enough in my life to be mama and daddy. And she just smiled, but she said, I still feel sorry for you. So mama died five weeks before revival broke out. And right before she died, I was in Virginia preaching. They told me to come to the phone. And they said, you need to rush home. Your mother's in a coma. I rushed home. My wife was there. My kids were there. My sisters and their children were there. And my brother-in-laws. When I walked in, mama roused up out of a coma. And she said, is that my boy? And I went over and sat down on the bed by her. And I said, Mama, I said, you know what I believe? I said, I believe you may be getting ready to go to heaven. She said, do you, son? <laughs> I said, I sure do. She said, well, there was three doctors in here last night dressed in white, and they told me they was going to be moving me. I was about to take a trip. So I'm glad I got to see you before I take my trip. I said, oh, me too, Mama. I knew what was going on. And so I remember I took her by her little gnarled up, little gnarled up hand. She was 84. And I said, Mama, would you do me a favor? I saw that woman take such abuse for Pentecost. Blood run out of her nose and her mouth. And I said, Mama, when you get to heaven, would you walk up to Jesus and ask him to bless your boy? And she pointed her finger at me like that, and she said, I'll do that very thing. So you want to know how the Browns revival took place? Mama died five weeks before revival broke out, and here's how it happened. She hit the streets of gold, said, where's Jesus? <laughs> And she, <laughs> and she went up to Jesus and said, Now, Jesus, I hear you're about to pour out revival somewhere in America. I want you to pour it out in my boys' church down there at Brownsville in Pensacola. You understand? <laughs> so anyway, I told you that story to tell you this. When I hit the floor that morning, my mama remembers she always said, I feel so sorry for you because you don't have a daddy. When I hit the floor on Father's Day, I said, Lord, I couldn't even move my lips. I, couldn't even, I had to think it. I couldn't even speak it. I said, Lord. What is this? And here's what the Lord said. Happy Father's Day. That's exactly his first words to me. Happy Father's Day. And then the Lord said, well, son, this is what you've just got through preaching on. I just got through preaching on the glory of God, nine parts. He said, this is what you just got through preaching on. And I said, Lord, it just hit me and it struck me that I preached nine parts on the glory of God, preached it effectively with great passion, great conviction, but whenever I experienced it, I didn't even know what it was. And here's one number one lesson that I learned. You can preach something, you can read something, you can believe something, but until you experience it, you don't even know what you're talking about. You have a mental knowledge of it. You have mental ascent toward it, but you don't even know what you're talking about until you experience it. You've got to taste and see that the Lord is good. I don't know about you, but I want all God's got for me. Can you say amen? amen. Lift up your hands one more time and let's just praise him here just for a minute. I'm not quite through, but just praise him. Lift it up and sustain it for two or three minutes. Come on, everybody. Shiparabosoto robokoto. Shibando rabasotoku parabayanto. I'm not quite through, but stand with me for just a minute. Come on, everybody, stand with me. Lift your voices, everybody. Just continue. Lift your voices. I feel the Lord in here. Shamanro Surabeando Lolaboko Rababasata. Hamando Kupa Rabasata Rabababa. Ha. 
You can be seated. I'm going to have a time of prayer in just a little while, but give, give me just a few more minutes. I want to tell you just a couple of things about revival. I'm mainly doing this for the young people that's here, but of course everybody can hear it and participate, but I'm mainly speaking because I want the young people and I want the prayer people here to hear this. When revival broke out, I never dreamed that that's what it felt like. I'd read about it. I'd read about Whitfield. I'd read about Finney. I'd read about many, many other revivalists down through the years, Paul or uh, Charles Wesley, John Wesley. I'd read about them, studied about them. I always got excited. Used to in class, before the Lord called me to preach, I used to sit and I'd write the word revival in my notebook. And I'd write Holy Spirit in my notebook. Just write the words and look at them. And when I'd see the word revival, just something just burn in my spirit. Just writing the word revival in my notebook. And I'd write the word Holy Spirit and just something would come on me and I just felt chills and I felt fire and I felt life. Just writing those words. And I wasn't even called to preach yet. And when the glory of God came in that church, it was so mind-boggling. It's hard even to this day for me to try to describe to somebody and tell them what it felt like. You've got to experience it, but you can't really tell it. But when the glory of God would come in that church for healing, we never would talk about this. Steve and I never would talk about it. There was a lot of things that we never would talk about because if we talked about it, people would get their mind on more of what we talked about than they would the Lord. And we was trying to focus everybody's attention on the Lord. So <laughs> when God would come in by the power of the Holy Spirit and he'd start to heal, it would be mainly during worship and you could feel, it feel like you be outside on a cloudy day and the sun would come out, you know, and you could feel heat on your ears and back of your hands. You just feel heat come in. And we always knew when we felt that heat, we knew that God was healing people. And sure enough, people would start screaming out, oh my God. Well, <laughs> I remember one night, and, and whenever I tell you these stories, I don't have to exaggerate. First of all, excuse me, first of all, I wouldn't exaggerate because I wouldn't mislead you and make you believe something that wasn't true. Second of all, I have no need to do that. The revival was great enough without telling you some kind of fantastic story. But I'm going to tell you what happened one night. We hadn't been going along in, in the revival, maybe six or seven months. Almost night after night, almost, you know, we was in revival from like seven in the morning and me and Steve would say goodbye the next morning. After sunup the next morning, we'd be in church all night long. The glory of God would never really come in in that church until after midnight with full power. I can't explain that. But it was like at that midnight hour that the glory of God would intensify somehow. It was like the waning of one day and the emerging of another day. It was strange. But you read about it in the Bible. At midnight, Paul and Silas began to pray. And the place was shaken. I experienced that in the Brownsville Revival. What does it mean? I don't know. I don't care. I just experienced it. Amen? And so we were there, and uh, Linda was leading worship, and when he was leading worship, it was like the sun came out. You could feel heat. Literally, you could feel it. You wouldn't have to say, do you feel that? We wouldn't even do that. We just knew God was healing. But I remember the church was so packed with people, by the thousands of people, some nights, there was 5,000, 6,000 people there on the campus, and we only could seat 2,500. <laughs> I remember I was sitting on the platform, and it felt like the sun come out, and right down here in this area, there was a woman just started screaming, ah! like that. And she was shaking her hands, and she had this look of horror on her face, and she wasn't looking in front. She wasn't looking to the side. She was looking at her husband. I don't know what that meant. Anyway, she was just like she was just screaming, standing in, in place, just shaking her hands and ha ha ha. And uh, I'm like this. You don't know me before revival broke out. You don't know how ultra conservative I was. And even when re revival broke out in my church, it was people came because they heard I was in the floor. And people came to see John Kilpatrick. That's how the crowd started coming. See, we're going to see John on the floor. Because I would stop anything that I didn't think 
You know, if I thought anything was sensational or anything was weird, oh man, I'd stop it. I was ultra conservative. So when God broke out at Brownsville, people thought, no, not Brown, no, not John Kilpatrick's church. So anyway, this woman starts screaming, and now we've been in revival about six or eight months, and so I'm thinking to myself, okay, we're in revival, yes, but you better have a good excuse to scream in my church. (laughs) So I grabbed a handheld microphone, and I was leaving the platform, and I walked down over there where me and Steve always stood at Brownsville, and I walked down there, and when I was walking toward her, she never looked at me, didn't care that I was coming. Just, (laughs) you know. Church of God does that a lot, I think. And uh, I looked. I got there right at the end of it. So help me. Tony's here. He travels with me. He can vouch for this. Her husband was a Vietnam veteran. And they threw a grenade in on one night, and it rolled, and he picked it up and was throwing it, and when he did, it blew off part of his hand. Blew a big moon out of his hand. His hand was growing back. The truth. His hand was growing back. That's pretty pitiful. That's a pretty pitiful patty cake. Come on, give the Lord praise. I'm not lying to you. Listen, you might be sitting out there thinking, he's lying to me. I'm not lying to you, friend. The Lord can do that and greater. We just need to believe him again. And so I looked and it was the most supernatural thing I've ever seen, but the most natural looking thing I've ever seen. It was like an invisible something, like an invisible sewing, heavenly sewing thing. Something just was whip stitching flesh on his hand and that moon was filling in like this. (laughs) I screamed with her. We screamed a duet for the Lord. (laughs) You know? I screamed, she screamed. I almost fainted. I almost fainted, honestly. The meat that was coming in on his hand matched the tan on the back of his hand and it matched the pink on the inside of his hand. God does all things well. He even matched the man's tan. Like, let me see. And his hand was growing back. And I thought to myself, God, See, Brownsville was known as a, as a repentance revival, and it really was, but there were tremendous miracles that took place, and it would usually happen whenever worship was going on. Got a call one night, about 5 o'clock, and they said there's a Jewish man coming down from Atlanta. He's got a brain tumor, and the brain tumor is as big as his fist. It's in the center of his brain. He's so dizzy, he's throwing up constantly. And they said... Pastor, they want to know if somebody can meet him out there when the van gets there. They had to run a handicapped van to get him down here. Could you pray for him so he'll be able to stay for the service? Now, he was not Messianic Jewish. He's Orthodox Jewish. So he went to the doctor, his neurologist, and he said to the neurologist, he said, can I take a trip? And his doctor was Jewish also. And the doctor said, why? Where do you want to go? He said, I hear that they've got a revival down in Pensacola, Florida, and I want to go down there and see if God will heal me. He said, blankety blank, no. You can't go. And the guy looked at the doctor and he said, doctor, am I dying? He said, yes, you are. He said, if I'm dying, what's it going to hurt? So the doctor looked up, stood up and pointed at me. He said, if you go, you go at your own risk, but you just understand I'm against it. So they brought him down in a rented van, handicapped van, when they got him there. I've never seen anybody I don't think in my life that sick. He had thrown up in that van all the way from Atlanta, and it was sloshing in the floorboard. I'm just trying to paint you a picture to show you how sick he was. His eyes was dancing sideways in his head like that. He was so dizzy that when they tried to get him out and get him in the wheelchair to roll him in the church, He just constantly throwing up. He couldn't stop throwing up. He was so dizzy. His world was just spinning out of control. I prayed for him, and I said, Lord, please let this man be able to be in this service tonight, Jesus. We ask you for a miracle. They brought him in, set him up in there about 5.15 in the afternoon. Church didn't start till 7. 
I had sort of forgot about it because we were so busy in those days, you know, just thousands of people. Every night from around the world, from the nations, planes were landing, you know, just from the nations, uh, charter planes from, from foreign nations, all kinds of things. So I just sort of forgot about it. That night during praise and worship, it felt like the sun came out. Bam! That man popped up out of that wheelchair. Just like that. He screamed it in a high tenor voice, like a little kid shrieking, I'm healed! Everything had stopped. His eyes stopped dancing in his head, wasn't throwing up. He popped up out of a wheelchair like a rocket. And I said to myself, that man's healed. Well, let me tell you what happened. He went back, he went back to Atlanta, walked in the doctor's office. And the doctor cussed when he saw him. Oh, hell. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I, said, <laughs> I didn't mean to say that. I'm sorry. Whoa. He said, oh, what happened to you? And he said, you remember? I told you I was going to that revival down there in Pensacola. He said, yes. He said, I'm healed. The doctor said, no, you're not. It's all in your mind. <laughs> no, you ain't healed. It's all in your mind. He said, no, you ain't healed. And, and the guy said, doctor, he said, listen, I know Medicare pays for all this, but he said, I'll pay for the MRI if you'll do a fresh MRI on me. The doctor said, okay. They did an MRI, come back out. O-H, you know, E-L-L. -L. You don't have it anymore. It's gone. The man was totally healed of the brain tumor. Now watch this. He was so impacted by the presence and the power of God that he loaded up 34 or 36, 37 Orthodox Jewish friends, male and female, old Jewish friends, brought them from Atlanta on Sunday morning to Brownsville. I preached that morning, and at the end we prayed for them, and they all were saved and baptized in the Holy Ghost that morning. Come on, give God praise. Woo! Give him praise. Hallelujah. Come on, stand to your feet. Give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's, here's what I'm trying to tell you in a nutshell. I'm going to quit. My time's gone. Here's what I'm trying to tell you in a nutshell. When you've been in something like that, you're ruined for life. You just run for life. Once you've had your feet under the table of true Pentecostal revival, nothing else will ever satisfy you. Nothing. I don't care what newfangled thing comes out. Nothing can replace the presence and the power of God. Hallelujah. If you don't mind, one more time before I shut down. Lift your hands one more time. Lift your voices. Let's, let's let God have his way in here. Come on. Just worship him. <laughs> Come on, church. Worship him. Lift your voices. Just worship him. If you want to, you can pray for somebody nearby you. Just lay hands on them if you want to. But let's just worship the Lord for a few minutes. Patora basato kubara manda bayando. Hallelujah. 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 Bless the Lord. I want every minister in the house, I don't care if you're a youth pastor, worship leader, pastor, associate pastor, whoever you may be, if you're in the ministry full time, that's the way you make your living. I want you to leave where you are and come forward. I just want to lay hands on you. Nothing special about me laying my hands on you, I promise you. But I just want to lay my hands on you and believe God to touch your life and to change your life. Would you do that, please? Everybody, just make your way down. Those of you that's in the ministry, full time. Hallelujah. Go ahead, friend. Just sing it for us and worship. Hallelujah. 
Yeah. You have won.